John, it's a pretty pivotal moment in Blackstone's history, reaching a trillion dollars in assets under management. But what does it really mean, both for the growth of Blackstone as well as the industry? Well, Shanali, it's great to be with you. Yes, this is an important milestone for our firm. Uh, when you think about uh, Blackstone started by Pete Peterson and Steve Schwarzman in 1985 with $400,000 and a dream, and today crossing a trillion dollars, that's a pretty remarkable achievement. It's a real credit to our people. It's a credit to the performance we've delivered to customers. Nothing matters more than that. And it also uh, reflects the real spirit of innovation of this firm. We're constantly uh, looking for new ways to serve our customers, new vehicles, new ge geographies to operate in. And when we look forward, what excites us is that investors are increasingly seeing alternatives as a core portion of their portfolio. Alternatives are really coming of age. They're saying, I can trade liquidity for higher returns for a portion of our portfolios. And as a result, we're seeing insurance companies, individual investors, pension funds who've been at it for some time, increase their allocations. And that gives our business a lot of runway as we look forward. More investors, more assets under management. The reality is that being bigger comes with more eyeballs as well. Do you expect more regulation to come as you grow? Well, we've always been regulated, and obviously, as you get bigger, you get more focus. I think the key thing about us as a firm is we operate uh, always by following the rules, but also as a capital light asset manager. So versus banks who are critically important financial institutions, we operate with virtually no net debt. Uh, we obviously don't take any deposits either. And we're very thoughtful on the structures we use to match the duration of our liabilities to our assets. So we think we're very well positioned and we're providing a valuable function both to the investors out there, but also to the economy at large. You know, in that trillion dollars, you're sitting on a record amount of money, a record amount of dry powder. This is almost $200 billion you have to put to work. At what scale do you start putting that money to work and how soon? If you look across Wall Street, there's a lot of frustration about this deal drought that has persisted. Well, you tend to see a slowdown in deal activity when levels of uncertainty are very high. And so if you think about this year, you had a lot of concern about where inflation was going, a lot of concern about how far the Fed would go. You had the banking crisis in March, and naturally you see a slowdown in deal activity. I think the good news is the tone has improved as we've worked through uh, this quarter. The deal market feels like it's unfreezing a bit. Um, if you look at our credit area, our direct lending, our pipeline is up more than double than where it was 90 days ago. So we're seeing more activity there, more activity in our tactical opportunities area where we help companies and investors by providing uh, flexible capital. Our secondaries business is seeing more activity. So I think as people feel better about um, the overall picture, a little more certainty, I think we'll see deal volume pick up as we move forward. Are the financing markets becoming open enough for you to do something big? At what time will we see Blackstone doing multi-billion dollar deals, perhaps deals along with partners again at that scale? Well, we've done a few large deals this year. Um, we, we announced at the end of last year, Emerson's climate technology business for $14 billion. We privatized Cvent, an online event management business, a multi-billion dollar transaction. Uh, we're looking at a number of things of scale. Obviously, the financing markets make it a little bit trickier, and you've got to be creative in trying to pull transactions together. So this takes some time. Um, but the good news is, as you point out, we've got $200 billion of dry powder, and that dry powder allows us to move when opportunities arise. I think we'll see more of those opportunities over the next year. 
Um, it's hard to put our finger on it exactly when it'll happen, but I just feel across our platform, there'll be some interesting things and scale is a real advantage for us. I wanna talk about AI for a second here because your data center business is one of the places where Blackstone has clearly been investing both in the United States and abroad. It has been appreciating quite significantly. Where do you see AI going and how are you making investments around that trend? So I think AI is going to have a profound impact on virtually every element of the global economy, obviously some areas more than others. For us, the good news is we started building out a data science team back in 2015. We've got more than 50 plus data scientists. We also own 200 plus companies, 10,000 plus real estate assets. So we get a lot of proprietary data ourselves that we're looking to harvest to make better decisions for our investors. When you think about the impact of AI, it's pretty significant. Machines can now not just uh, compute around numbers, but also text and images and, and give us results in the form of text and images. And so there are businesses that'll be more vulnerable. If you think about lower value add service businesses, maybe a call center business, you've gotta be cautious. There'll be businesses like data centers where we've seen a step function increase in demand. We bought a company QTS where we've uh, grown its capacity, we think in the next three or four years by six fold versus what it was when we bought it for $10 billion two years ago. And then there are all sorts of companies where you've got to think about the processes that they operate with. So if you think about healthcare companies or financial institutions, how they can reduce costs with these new productivity tools. So Blackstone is totally focused on this. We think we can bring our companies real competitive advantages, but you've got to devote the resources. You know, how do you think about this in terms of the talent story? Are you hiring from different places than you may have before, knowing that technology is so much of the future? Well, there's no question that we didn't have a data science business, as I said before, 2015. So we've got a different crew of people. We're obviously hiring more people in our internal technology function. We opened up an office in Miami to get more diverse tech talent, which I think has been super helpful for our business. We've grown our growth business. We've been looking for more people who have tech expertise. We've brought on a number of senior advisors in technology overall. And our head of portfolio operations, Jen Morgan, came from SAP where she was the co-CEO. So yeah, we understand the world's changing and we need people with the right expertise. And then against that, of course, maintain our real rigor and financial discipline. Let's talk about the macro environment for a second, John, because earlier you talked about uncertainty being kind of the killer of deal making here. Is some of that uncertainty clearing, particularly as it comes to inflation? Yeah, I think the good news on inflation is it's trending down. The Fed is really winning this war. They're not ready to declare victory. But what we see in our portfolio companies is input costs really coming down now to less than 2%. We see wages, which were running higher than 7% mid last year, to growing at less than 5%. Forward indicators in hiring and vacancies are also positive. So the labor market is starting to soften. It's still pretty strong, but I think that's gonna be helpful as the Fed looks forward. Now, what do I think happens? I think they're gonna raise rates, it sounds like, one more time. And then they're gonna hold them here for a longer period of time to try to slow the economy. And we expect they'll be successful in doing that. Um, we don't think this is 08, 09 in terms of a slowdown, but you do have to anticipate some slowing of economic activity, some increase in unemployment. But we have, at this point, gone through an inflation shock. We've gone through an interest rate shock. And now we've got a bit of an economic slowdown, but we're getting through this. And I think that's one of the reasons why we see some enthusiasm in the market. When people think about concerns still left about the economy, there are still a lot of concerns and you see it in the write downs already for certain companies when it comes to commercial real estate. I know that your portfolio, you've leaned out of office for a while now. How do you feel about the direction of travel for the property industry moving forward? What are the pitfalls that some investors might be falling into here? 
Well, I think there are continue to be big challenges in traditional uh, office buildings in the U.S., particularly older buildings. Vacancy levels are very high. Rents are under pressure. But where you invest matters. So if you are deployed today in stronger areas like logistics and student housing, data centers, which we talked about, the fundamentals there are very strong. And geographically, obviously, some cities are under significant pressure. Let's use San Francisco as an example. And yet we see a lot of strength in Texas and Florida. And so where you invest, that is key. I think our team in real estate has done a terrific job. And then looking forward, the positives are rates are coming down or at least are no longer going up at the short end like they were. And the long end seems to have stabilized. And that is helpful for commercial real estate values. Also, new supply is coming down, which is another positive when you think about commercial real estate. So both of those things give us some confidence as we look over the intermediate term. Speaking of real estate also, there's a lot of news over the last couple of months here about BREIT. This is the product you have for retail investors, semi-liquid, tied to the real estate industry. Do you see withdrawal pressure starting to ease on that business? Well, what we've seen here is a decline in share redemptions. They uh, peaked in January. They're down nearly 30 percent at this point. That's obviously a positive sign. We've said we think it'll take time to work through the backlog, but the key is performance. Um, and we've delivered three times the public read index over six and a half years. We put the capital in what we think are the right places, logistics, rental housing, data centers in the Sun Belt. And ultimately, investors appreciate that performance. And I would just point out on the redemptions, if you were an investor who put in for a redemption at the end of November and you continued to do that, at this point, you'd have more than 90 percent of your money back. So we feel good about the product and the way it's working for our investors. You know, if you think about where we were a year ago and where we are now, it's kind of like a 180 reversal here, both in the markets as well as how you are benefiting from them. Higher revenue, more profit. Your stock right now, as it stands, uh, of Thursday morning is worth more than $10 billion in market value than at Goldman Sachs. With kind of this reversal of fortunes and, and this appreciation of your earnings and your stock price, do you think that you have space to be adding more people on? How are you thinking about growth? Well, we continue to see a lot of runway for our business. You know, this movement towards alternatives continues. Um, pension funds now looking much more at private credit, which they're excited about, as we are as well, given the returns you can generate as a lender today on a senior basis. We see lots of opportunity in asset classes like infrastructure, opportunities in places like India, where we've been the leading real estate and, and private equity investor for a number of years. We see investors um, opening up in terms of who's willing to look at alternatives, insurance companies, an area we've grown quite a bit, individual investors, which we touched on. And so we see both very compelling places to deploy capital and to raise capital. So we still see a very bright future for our business. Is there an uptick in the amount of resumes you're given, given this uh, movement into alternatives? Well, it's interesting. This year, I just spoke to this starting analyst. We have uh, 167 starting analysts at the firm this year. That's uh, versus more than 60,000 resumes we received. So it is very competitive getting a job at Blackstone. But that's another reason I feel so good about the firm. There's so many talented people who want to work here. And when you think about a firm like ours, what really matters, it's about having great people who care a ton. And we've got a lot of that. John, it's funny. Uh, you heard Jamie Dimon call Blackstone out by name in their own earnings report as a function of regulation shrinking the banks, money moving into private assets, Blackstone being a potential beneficiary of this. Do you see that movement that he says you guys are dancing in the streets? Well, I think banks play such a critical role in the U.S. economy. They're very important, but obviously they're quite different uh, than capital light asset managers like ourselves. Um, you know, banks, one of the challenges that has emerged um, that we saw earlier this year is that deposits given technology can move very quickly. And of course, deposits are, are backed by the federal government. 
And so the nice thing about us is as a firm, we have uh, virtually no net debt. We operate our vehicles with very limited leverage and match funded in terms of asset and liability length. And that allows us to originate and hold uh, debt for long periods of time. And so if you think about us investing on behalf of our insurance clients, they've got a very long duration. So they can hold certain consumer loans and equipment loans. And so it's a natural reason why for us partnering with the banks makes sense because we have the right kind of balance sheets to hold things for long term. So I think this is a very healthy thing for the system, which is we not only have a robust banking system, strong capital markets, but now private capital with longer duration structures can hold because we're really in the storage business on behalf of our clients. And I think that's a very healthy sign for the system. Before I let you go, is there some sort of celebration inside of Blackstone on reaching a trillion dollars? How, how are the people celebrating? You know, I think we'll, we're going to have our regular Monday BXTV. We'll talk about this event, but we're not uh, really celebratory uh, in that nature. We think the key thing is this is a long journey. We've got to continue to deliver for our customers. It's a reminder that we have come a long way, that what Steve created here is, is really incredible um, and that we should feel proud about that. But we just go back to our day jobs, do our work and try to deliver for our customers.